good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the launch of the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Services Aboriginal Community Justice Report Project. Um, I'd like to start the day by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which we are all meeting on today across Australia. I pay my respects to the first peoples of this land and elders past, present and future. Um, and particularly also uh, recognising that the work of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the criminal legal space, um, uh, some of whom are joining us today, um, including elders uh, from the Aboriginal Justice Caucus. This land was and always will be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land and sovereignty was never ceded. My name's Andrea Lux. I'm from the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, and I'm very pleased to be introducing webinar two of our series, uh, Unlocking Victorian Justice. Today's webinar is entitled Aboriginal Community Justice Reports Project, Improving Sentencing Outcomes and Reducing Over-Incarceration of Aboriginal People. BOWS is undertaking this project, which is funded with an Australian Research Council grant in, partner in partnership with the Australasian Institute of Judicial Administration, the University of Technology, Sydney and Griffith University. This important project aims to reduce the over-incarceration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and improve sentencing processes and outcomes for Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander defendants. I would encourage everyone to uh, look at our invite for the, the detailed and incredibly impressive uh, CVs of our panelists today. Um, but I want to limit my time speaking to you all because we want to hear from them. So briefly today, the panel will be introduced by uh, Judge Lawson, who's the judge in charge of the, the County Court, Quarry Court Division. Judge Lawson has a long association with the Koori Court, having participated in the working party that led to the formation of the division in the court. Narita Waite is a proud Yorta Yorta woman and the CEO of the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service. Distinguished Professor Larissa Berendt is URRLIA and Camilla Roy woman and is the Associate Dean of Indigenous Research at the University of Technology, Sydney and the Director of Research and Academic Programs at the Jambana Institute. Also with us today, we have Professor Thalia Anthony, a Professor of Law at the University of Technology, Sydney, who collaborates with researchers from the UTS Jambana Indigenous Institute for Indigenous Education and Research. Her research specializes in the criminal justice system and its intersections with colonization. We are also lucky to have some international speakers today from Canada. Jonathan Rudden is the program director at the Aboriginal Legal Services in Canada. In 1990, he was hired to establish Aboriginal Legal Services and has been with uh, the ALS since then. Vincent Louis is the founder and director of Tega Vision in Quebec, Canada. This organization supports Aboriginal programs to offer and promote holistic and culturally meaningful ways to intervene with people within the justice and correctional system continuum. In early 2012, she introduced Glidu reports in Quebec. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the, the webinar goes for one an hour and 15 minutes. It will be recorded and we'll make it available online afterwards. Uh, there's a chat function, um, but there's also a specific Q&A function. So please feel free to ask your questions there. Um, we'll be able to answer some of the questions in the chat. And there'll also be time for, for questions and answers at the end of, of the webinar as well. And anything that we don't get to today, um, we can also follow up with you um, going forward. Um, we'll also share with you today the uh, Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service website for the project, which provides uh, more information um, and also more information specifically about the referral process, eligibility and suitability for the project. Uh, for those of you who are on social media, we encourage you to tweet this event. It's being live tweeted by the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services, uh, and we thank them for that. And please use the um, Unlocking Victorian Justice hashtag. So that's it from me. I'll uh, pass on to uh, 
Judge Lawson from the County Court to uh, introduce the panel today. Thank you, Andrea. I too shall begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land upon which I'm meeting you all from today. And I too pay my respects to elders past and present. And I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander persons who are participating today, either as a spectator or as part of the panel. I congratulate each of the project members, the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, the University of Technology, Sydney, Griffith University and the Australasian Institute for Judicial Administration for achieving this significant milestone. I am pleased to be able to speak today in my capacity as the head of the Koori Court Division of the County Court, Victoria. The Koori Court Division is a specialist court that commenced operations in 2008. It is the only sentencing court in Australia for Aboriginal offenders in a higher jurisdiction. The jurisdiction of the court is broad based and deals with sentencing of offenders for indictable crimes within the court's jurisdiction, with the exception of sex offences. The judges and the career court officers of the county court, led by Terry Stewart, are very excited about this project and its potential. And I acknowledge the real potential for the reports to provide better information about the background and the circumstances of all Aboriginal participants in the project, as well as being able to identify suitable and culturally appropriate support programs so that judges may make better informed sentencing decisions. Over many years, I personally have had the great privilege of sitting with and listening to our elders and respected persons drawn from Aboriginal communities across Victoria. They bring their collective wisdom and knowledge of their ancestors, Aboriginal tradition and culture to each sentencing conversation held in the Koori Court. They speak powerfully to each of the Koori offenders about the need to break the cycle of offending and jail. They strive to achieve better justice outcomes for their people. The elders always speak to Koori participants about how maintaining a connection to ancestors, culture, family, community and country is important and how that in turn contributes to building strong and safe Aboriginal communities. They emphasise to each Koori know who they are and where they are to encourage greater respect for themselves, their heritage and for others. They seek to give hope to each Koori participant to take responsibility and to imagine a better pathway so that the person may focus on a better future for themselves, their children and community. The Aboriginal Community Justice Reports will thus complement the work of our elders and respected persons in reconnecting people back to their culture and practices. For those Koori offenders who elect to have their matters heard in the general list, these reports will ensure that the best available information is presented to the judges, but offers a fuller picture of the person and their needs to assist the judges make well-informed decisions about the Koori offender who is appearing before them for sentence, thus improving the sentencing process. Sadly, many Koori's and First Nations people who come before the courts do not have a good understanding of their culture and history and connections, so that these reports will also be a very powerful resource for each participant to potentially reconnect them with their cultural heritage and to guide them for the future. The reports will also have the capacity to encourage the judges to have a greater understanding of Aboriginal culture and history and will inform them about what culturally supported programs are available that seek to address the underlying drivers of the offending behaviour. This in turn will play an important role in improving outcomes and in hopefully reducing incarceration rates of Aboriginal offenders. I thank you for inviting me to introduce the panellists and I wish you all the best for the project. Thank you. 
Thank you, Judge Lawson. Um, and particularly thank you for really being a champion for, for this project and seeing its potential um, in improving sentencing outcomes, in having more culturally appropriate responses within our system, and of course, reducing the, the shameful over-incarceration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Victoria. I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, my CEO, Narita Waite, um, proud Yorta Yorta woman and uh, an absolute visionary in this space who's been championing uh, this project for a very long time. On to you, Narita. Thanks, Andrea, for that warm welcome. Um, I think visionary is overselling it. Um, I think just logical <laughs> would be the more appropriate term. Um, I first would like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, which is where I'm speaking from today, um, and pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Islander people here today. Um, also just like to thank Judge Lawson for introductory remarks and um, with you in our corner, Judge, how can we fail? So, um, in 2015, Aboriginal community justice reports were identified as a key um, VOWS policy priority. And that same year, an M MOU was developed between VOWS and Toronto Aboriginal Legal Service. And today we're lucky to be joined by Jonathan from ALS who will also speak on the panel. Um, and in 2016, Toronto ALS visited VOWS. Um, at that time, research was also being conducted by Thalia, Larissa and other academics on pre-sentence reports in Victorian South Wales, the Aboriginal narrative reports in NT in Queensland, in Canada based on interviews with judges, lawyers and report witness writers. Um, and Thalia will speak to that in more detail later on. In 2007, VALS then reciprocated and went to visit Toronto LS um, and other Gladue report services in Canada, uh, which was an incredibly enlightening experience and certainly informed um, our next steps going forward. Uh, in 2017, the Aboriginal Justice Caucus, which is part of the Abri um, Aboriginal Justice Agreement, also identified Aboriginal community justice reports as a priority. In that same year, um, we released a discussion paper called Aboriginal Community Justice Reports Addressing Over-Incarceration. In that paper, we proposed trialling Aboriginal Community Justice Reports, which is a pre-sentence community written report, which aims to gather information about underlying impacts on, on the Aboriginal client. The purpose of preparing such reports was to identify possible underlying drivers of the individual offending, in particular those that may relate to the impacts of trauma and colonisation, cultural loss, family loss, all of those things that for the people we know um, that our loved ones, actually in the family, even in some cases ourselves, have suffered. It also provides a further voice to the client, their family and community, and thus greater involvement in and engagement with the justice system. So rather than silencing voices, about elevating those voices so the courts can hear what the real life experience of that person was, and that can inform sentencing that is therapeutic, that actually goes to the aims of the justice system, which is about rehabilitation, not punishment. A year later, in 2018, the Victorian Government and the Aboriginal Justice Caucus committed to piloting Aboriginal Community Justice Reports over a five year period of the AJA Phase 4. This commitment was to trial Aboriginal Community Justice Reports, modelled on Canada's Gladue Reports, to provide information to judicial officers about an Aboriginal person's life experience and history that impacts their offending, and to identify more suitable sentencing arrangements to address these underlying factors. Thankfully, in 2019, Funding was acquired by UTS to pilot the Aboriginal Community Justice Reports project. It's for 1.8 million over three years, so very little, um, with some in-kind support being provided by VALS um, and Queensland, which is the location for the pilot, um, by Griffith University and Five Bridges. The project is also being supported by the Australian Institute of Judicial Administration, Aboriginal Legal Services in Ontario and Canada um, and New Zealand, um, report writing services and staff. In 2020, in VAL submission to Sensing Act reform project, we recommended the government support self-determined initiatives to improve sentencing outcomes for our people, including by directing dedicated funding from AJA Phase 4 to the project currently being carried out by VALS and its partners on Aboriginal Community Justice Reports. Whilst it is a, pro a pilot project, we certainly hope these reports will become an established part of the sentencing landscape into the future and some of the judges and elders alike see as beneficial to their decision-making processes. We aim to establish a Victorian Aboriginal Community Justice Report Service model, which can be scaled up and broadly implemented statewide. We also recommend in this submission amending section 5.2 of the Sentencing Act. So for the purposes of sentencing, courts are actually required to take into account the unique systemic and background factors affecting Aboriginal and Islander people. 
um, interestingly enough, uh, just yesterday, in case anybody's missed it, um, the Truth and Justice Commission was announced in Victoria. Um, we understand um, that the process will mark the beginning of a conversation long overdue and a commitment to change. It also compels us to confront what's come before, to acknowledge the pain in our past lives and in our present. The unique systemic historical and background factors affecting our people are not well understood and considered by legal systems across Australia and Victoria. The Commission is an opportunity for that to change so that we can recognise how the unique historical experiences and Aboriginal people in Victoria, including land dispossession and rural children, have led to today's entrenched disadvantage and equitable in treatment of Aboriginal people. Recognising this history of violence and dispossession is essential to understanding and addressing the shortcomings of today's criminal legal system in which Aboriginal people continue to be disproportionately represented. The violent colonial history of, of Victoria has created and shaped today's legal system, which so often fails to deliver true justice for our people. A collective understanding of Victoria's colonial legacy can help guide the reforms necessary for realising a truly equitable legal system. This commission will just be a first step though. It is not um, going to solve all the world's problems. It is simply a first step to, have, to coming together, having a shared understanding and working out how we can implement that shared understanding to make the systems more equitable for all, not just for some. The Aboriginal Community Justice Reports, which vows is proud to be piloting in partnership with UTS, aims to assist courts to take into account these unique systemic background factors affecting our people when they make their sentencing decisions. They'll give judges like Judge Lawson access to information about Aboriginal persons' culture and mob, as well as the way that colonisation impacted their life, family and community. They'll also focus on individual strengths, as well as strengths of their community, echoing the declared intention that the Commission will recognise the strength and survival of Aboriginal people. This is not about deficits, it's about strengths and possibilities. It is important also to recognise that this reform has been advocated for not only at the Victorian level, but at the Commonwealth level as well. The Australian Law Reform Commission in 2017 recommended in its Pathways to Justice and Inquiry into the Incarceration Rate of Aboriginal and Torres Peoples that state and territory governments, in partnership with relevant Aboriginal and Torres organisations, should develop and implement schemes that would facilitate the preparation of Indigenous experience reports, ACGRs in normal language, for Aboriginal and Torres offenders appearing for sentence in superior courts. As this project progresses in Victoria, we hope to see similar reports introduced in other Australian jurisdictions as well. We know that there are commitments and projects already existing in other jurisdictions. In 2017, the ACT government committed to trial the use of these experience reports in sensing courts in ACT, although there hasn't been significant progress in implementing this commitment, it remains on the agenda. In Queensland, Five Bridges has been developing narrative reports for use in Murray courts in Maroochydore, Brisbane and Ipswich since 2015. And other justice groups in Queensland also do similar reports. In the NT, the draft Aboriginal Justice Agreement currently being developed includes a commitment to implement Aboriginal, Aboriginal experience reports as well. <clears throat> Broadly, the project aims to reduce over-incarceration over of Aboriginal Islander people which is inherently important today, as we see that um, under the last um, the last couple of terms of the Andrews government, uh, incarceration of our people has increased. Interaction has increased. Um, at the moment, um, during COVID nineteen, we saw our community workers doing over fifty thousand calls to people who were incarcerated in in police cells, and it was at times spending more than three to four days in those cells. Um, we're seeing that there are high rates of unreported family violence occurring in our communities. Um, there has been higher um, child removals and all of these things play into how we experience the legal system, but also then how we are treated by it and how that can result in, in, in us being charged, arrested and convicted of offences, which um, often sometimes wouldn't happen to somebody else um, who was non-Aboriginal. It also improves sentencing process outcomes theoretically, um, for um, our defendants by providing the court information it's never had at hand. As already mentioned, the reports are modelled off the Gladue reports. Um, they will not be prescriptive approach, or approach to reports writing, as that would undermine the value of the reports in furthering individualised justice in sentencing, because no one person is the same. 
Information in the reports will include a more holistic account of individual circumstances, including as they relate to a person's community, culture and strength, and community-based options. There'll be mechanisms by which to provide the court information, including culture, identity, individual's connection to land, community culture, underlying drivers of their offending, the individual's strengths and strengths of their community, perceptions of the individual by relevant community members, community-based options and programs, relevant sentencing decision. They'll actually differ to pre-sentence reports, which instead focus on risk and the criminologic needs of the defendant. The project will sit in our community justice programs, separate to our criminal law section, as well as all our other legal sections. Information barriers are in place to ensure there's no conflict of interest. The report serves have separate office space and staff to legal practice. There will be separate electronic, electronic record keeping and databases, restricted access to records, appropriate training and protocols. There are three staff employed by the project, all Aboriginal women. We have two report writers and a case worker who will provide each person who participates with support and care. And most importantly, the project is not just open to VAS clients. It's open to um, clients of Victoria Legal Aid, um, private practitioners, other legal services out there um, in Victoria um, who have an Aboriginal client who could benefit from this. And um, that matter sits in the county court. So how, do you, how are you eligible? How do you get into the, into the program? Fairly easy. So a referral from Aboriginal Community Justice Report um, can be made by completing a referral form and emailing it to the project's central email address, um, which is on the VALS website. So you can find that refer referral from there, further information, follow up and the email to all attendees. Um, to be considered, you just have to be Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander. The matter has to be listed for pre-hearing. The matter must be listed in the County Koori Court Division or in the general list before a judge who is eligible to sit in the Koori Court Division and it has to be listed at Melbourne or the Trove Valley. The person, for whom the, per the person for whom the report is being written must consent to participating. That consent must be free and prior and informed. Suitability is assessed by um, the staff situated in our um, CJP section. To enable assessment of suitability for an Aboriginal Community Justice Project, the lawyer must have initial meeting with the with the project staff after sending through the referral. The person whose matter is before the court must have initial meeting with the staff and there must be sufficient notice to be provided to enable ACGR project staff to draft the report. So not a day before, not two weeks. Um, we are hoping for an ideal period of eight weeks to ensure a proper, thorough um, and empathetic report. And given that time frame, we urge all the lawyers out there to make that referral at the Camille mention stage. So we can begin receiving referrals for project from lawyers who work at VALS and BLA and other legal services from today. Um, so feel free, jump on the website, um, check out our referral form, um, go through your client lists, um, think about what Aboriginal clients before the county call record in Melbourne and Latrobe would be eligible. Um, and if you have any questions, reach out via email or pick up a phone and give us a call. Um, and we will certainly try to respond to all those queries after today's webinar as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you to Narita for um, providing that, that background to the project um, and how we've gotten to, to this point today. So you can see there's been quite a lot of background work involved um, and there's certainly been quite a number of reports um, supporting having this approach when it comes to sentencing of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, I can see that in the chat, we've shared the website. So please feel free to, to go to that website and, and get more information on the reports um, project going forward. Um, I am very pleased to introduce our next speaker, distinguished professor, Larissa Berendt. Um, I'm sure she's very well known to many people on this webinar. Um, she's been a staunch advocate for improving criminal, the criminal legal system um, and uh, access to, to equitable uh, justice responses for, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I will pass on to Larissa now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, hello to everyone. I'm here on Gadigal land and I'd like to acknowledge this country and pay my respects to the custodians who hold the traditional knowledge of this land and who generously share it with us. And I'm really honoured to be here at this seminar at this launch of the Aboriginal Community Justice Reports Project. Um, and uh, my remarks are, I guess, a bit more introductory to the panels. But it seems fitting as we fast approach this 30 year anniversary of the delivery of the final 
final report of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody that we do some deep reflecting on what we've achieved since then, but also on how far we've yet to go. But just this week alone, there've been two Aboriginal deaths in custody, taking the number since the Royal Commission closer to 500, a grim milestone that we will no doubt reach. And this speaks much to what hasn't changed with tough on crime policy approaches and failures to provide alternative pathways and uh, to invest in addressing underlying issues being just a few of the key factors that explain why Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to be overrepresented in the criminal justice system, especially if they are women or juveniles. But I think there's also been continuing and important progress made as well. The community advocacy led by Tanya Day's family to decriminalise public drunkenness in Victoria recently shows the ongoing effort to ensure the spirit of the recommendations of the Royal Commission are implemented. And those kind of steps will prevent further deaths in custody. Judicial education, I think has been one area where a lot of investment has been made to ensure real systemic change. And Judge Lawson's comments earlier, I think really reflect that commitment of the judiciary in this space. I think while it's true to say that the law itself has continued to attempt to provide standards to make illegal instances of overt racism in certain circumstances in our community, Racism continues to be a defining aspect of lived First Nation experience. And I think that while overt racism has become easily identified to most people, I think we've also developed an increasing awareness and understanding of the pervasiveness and toxicity of unconscious bias and the need to address that also. And it's that ability at addressing that kind of unconscious bias that's just one of the reasons why the Aboriginal Community Justice Reports project is so important. And I know a lot's already been said about that project and there's more to come, but I just wanted to make one other key point in my introductory remarks. Aboriginal Community Justice Reports, as you've already heard, are about creating room for and properly positioning Aboriginal voices, perspectives and experiences and about providing understanding of context and underlying issues. And they can be critical in assisting members of the judiciary in appreciating the complexities and relationships in a, in a case that they're considering and help to provide a richer understanding of options available. It's therefore been absolutely critical in this project that the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service has played a central and leading role. So I grew up around Redfern, so from a young age, I appreciated that it was the home of our first Aboriginal medical service and the first Aboriginal legal service. It is a community that's always understood the concept of self-determination in practice, in really real ways, and saw our community controlled organisations as a central pillar of achieving that ideal of self-determination. And particularly in relation to issues around justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, services led by us that understand our issues and know the best answers in addressing them have just been essential. And while self-determination is a really important principle, I always like to emphasize that it gets the best result. There's a lot of research that shows that community controlled organizations, uh, when they play a critical role, um, are vital in any attempt to close a gap. They're best able to represent and advocate for First Nations people, and they continue to play this really important role, even though they're severely under-resourced for the work that they do. The leadership of an organisation like VALS and of Narita, who I don't shy away from calling a visionary, makes research like what we're talking about today that we've done in, um, in partnership with them at UTS um, possible. Uh, they've provided the vision and direction, access and relationships, credibility and knowledge. And I think it's important to not to um, acknowledge that projects like this are reshaping 
the academic world. And projects like this have a very different genesis now to what they used to have. Researchers no longer get to ask, how can a community organisation assist with my research? We've been teaching the academy to ask, how can my research skills best assist this community organisation, an organisation like VALS led by Narita, in doing the work that it knows needs to be done. So um, from my perspective on behalf of the team at UTS and as particularly acknowledging Thalia Anthony's leadership in this project, we've been honoured to do this work side by side and under the leadership of VALS. And as we continue this morning to hear about this really important work, I hope it's also an opportunity to acknowledge the work of the Aboriginal community in leading the way in the changes needed to really make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larissa. Um, I think it's very much a case that, that our experience working with UTS on this project is that, that the approach has been exactly as you've said, how can the research uh, skills and expertise of, of the Academy assist Aboriginal community controlled organisations do that work that needs to be done um, and achieve self-determination. Um, so we are very grateful and, and excited for this partnership um, and the change in direction in, in, a, in um, universities and, and the leadership of, of UTS in this space. Um, as mentioned by Larissa, Professor Thalia Anthony has been a leader in this project as well, um, working closely with us, and I'm very pleased to introduce her and, and to hear from her today. Thanks so much, Andrea. Um, I honour the Gadigal and Wongal peoples of the Eora Nation, where I work, live and grow up my children. In Gadigal language, I greet you with the words Bajari Gamawara and I lend my solidarity to First Nations claims to language, self-determination and justice. I acknowledge, as Larissa mentioned, the lives of two First Nations people who tragically died in Sydney prisons in the past week. Today, I wanna to talk about the motivation and hopes we bring to this project as researchers. Along with Larissa Barron and Eleanor Marchetti, I came to this project from a deep sense of frustration with the system that criminalizes First Nations people and the harms that flow from this system. My research background is especially focused on criminal sentencing and how that produces and reproduces often unwittingly, sometimes um, consciously stereotypes about First Nations peoples and communities. We have especially identified in our research the bias in pre-sentence reports that are written about First Nations people. With researchers at Swinburne University, we have identified that Victorian reports are substantially deficit-based, focusing on criminogenic and risk factors. We also found that they sparingly address Aboriginal background, including family, community and culture, and rarely through a strengths-based prison. Prism. Um, based on our interviews with Aboriginal women in prison, which is part of an ongoing project with Professor Berem, we were told that negative stereotypes in pre-sentence reports made Aboriginal women feel dehumanised and worthless. In interviews with lawyers and judicial officers as part of this project, we learned that sentencing courts nonetheless rely on these reports in the absence of other information. It can contribute to sentence outcomes that do not reflect the needs and circumstances of the person. Both lawyers and judicial officers told us in interviews that they felt Gladue-like reports would enhance individualised justice and realise the High Court's observation in Bug Me that an individual's background circumstances need to be tendered in court for the purpose of culpability considerations. This led us to undertake an exploratory analysis of Gladue reports in Canada, as well as similar work in Queensland and the Northern Territory, where Aboriginal communities impart community information to sentencing courts. Five Bridges, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community justice group in Queensland, prepares reports that are part of this project. In preliminary research, we found the information prepared by Aboriginal people 
best represents Aboriginal lives to the courts, especially in terms of cultural identities, connections and relationships. And for this reason, we've recruited three Aboriginal report writers and a caseworker, Shannon McLeod, Rachel Bembo and Tasha Jago. Now, looking back to 2017, when Bowles had started to undertake the groundwork for the Aboriginal Community Justice Reports Initiative, we collectively recognised our mutual commitments and relative strengths to build this pilot project that we launched today. We wanted to have it grounded in knowledge and experience and to honour Val's leadership in the work. We wanted to produce an evidence base that will set up Aboriginal community justice reports for the long term and ideally until we inhabit a justice system that does not heavily depend on criminalising First Nations people for its existence. Thus, we began to chart a course for introducing these reports in Victorian courts. Four years, a pandemic and widespread consultations later, we have received funding, ethics approval and support from courts and stakeholders to commence this project. So this launch for me is a testament to the tireless work and unswerving commitment of VOWS to achieve justice for Aboriginal people and communities. In relation to our research plan going forward, what we will seek to do is analyse the reports that are produced, observe court processes and interview Aboriginal defendants, elders, interview lawyers and judges, as well as writers and caseworkers on the project. We will assess the quality of information produced in the report, including as it relates to the individual's culture, relationships um, with community, people's identity, their challenges, but importantly, their strengths, as well as the histories of the community in which the person grew up, um, how Aboriginal people um, have been in the community, have been affected by colonial injustices and ongoing racism, as well as the supports and strengths in the community. We'll also look at how the Aboriginal community justice reports affect the sentence process, such as the submissions made by the lawyers, the questions by the judges, and the experiences of the Aboriginal person being sentenced. And what, if any, um, impact that report has on sentence outcomes in terms of sentence mitigation or other options that are raised in the report and relied on by the court. We attempt to draw an Indigenous methodology that ensures the perspectives of Aboriginal defendants and elders in the court are elevated rather than simply focusing on the institutional responses to the reports alone. The perspectives of Aboriginal defendants on both the reports and the support they receive from the specialist caseworker that's dedicated to this project will be addressed in our findings. And we aim to make this research accessible to Aboriginal people and organisations, as well as stakeholders who will oversee its rollout across courts, um, in other courts, especially magistrates courts and other locations, which is the ultimate hope at the conclusion of this project. So I'll look forward to any questions, but I just wanna end by saying, that while the reports may be a drop in the ocean of change that is needed to decarcerate Aboriginal people and enhance self-determination, they are nonetheless very symbolic of the Aboriginal leadership required to push back on carceral trends and develop alt alternatives that are community-based. The reports are not just about improving criminal sentencing, I believe, but reshaping relationships in which Aboriginal voices are heard respected and critical in reshaping the outcomes in their lives, including voices being heard in courts and across the legal sector. Thank you. Thank you, Thalia. Um, I, I found it, although I've worked in this space for quite a while, I still found it really hard to hear um, outcomes of, of your own research and, and Larissa's research that people who are involved in the criminal legal system uh, feel worthless. Um, that's really stuck with me. Um, and I find that incredibly uh, sad and really an unacceptable uh, state of affairs. And I hope that with, with these reports looking at not just deficits, but looking at strengths and opportunities for real rehabilitation, for um, 
obviously also improving community safety through through that mechanism and, and, and real rehabilitation, but also um, moving away from carceral responses. Um, and I know both Thalia and Larissa have mentioned um, the, the devastating news that two uh, Aboriginal people have, have passed away in New South Wales prisons recently. Um, our next speaker is from, from Canada, from um, the Aboriginal Legal Service, Jonathan Rudden. Um, Jonathan, you've worked in this uh, space for a very long time. Um, I think everyone on this webinar will be very keen to hear from you about the Gladue reports um, to see what's already happened in Canada and what we can aspire to um, in Australia and Victoria and, and kind of tailoring that response to, to the unique needs and um, context of, of Victoria and Australia. I'll pass on to you, Jonathan. Thanks very much and uh, hello everyone. Um, I too want to uh, acknowledge the land, but it's always difficult in these Zoom sort of affairs when we are on many different lands. So let me simply acknowledge uh, the elders past, present and future, the guidance that we receive from them and the wisdom which guides certainly the work that we do at Aboriginal Legal Services. And that's for Indigenous peoples around the world, but specifically in Canada and Australia and more specifically in the province of Ontario in the state of Victoria. Um, as Andrea said, uh, I work at Aboriginal Legal Services. That's our English name. Our Anishinaabe Moan name is Gakina Gwai Wabama Debwewin, which translates as all those who seek the truth. And that doesn't mean that we have the truth, but we help people, we hope, find the truth that is relevant to them. And in the context of this discussion, that's where Gladu reports come in. We try and help the courts find the truth as it is necessary for sentencing and and the process helps the individuals themselves find the truth about their lives. Um, so I'm going, I have a limited amount of time and I have so much that I can say at those who have heard me speak before. So let me get right to this. Um, Gladue reports emerged in Canada uh, after Canada's sentencing laws were changed. So we have a uh, national criminal code in Canada and we, the law was amended in 1996, and one of the sentencing provisions said that judges should look for alternatives to incarceration for all offenders uh, that are reasonable in the circumstances, but with particular attention to the circumstances of Aboriginal offenders. Now, no one really knew what that section meant until 1999, when the Supreme Court of Canada issued their decision in a case called Gladue. This is hence why we have the term Gladue reports. Uh, Gladue is a case that Aboriginal Legal Services, uh, our Aboriginal Legal Services uh, intervened and we made, I think, some very important uh, points to the court. And that, that decision, I think, is really, I, I commend it to people. It's a very important decision. And in that decision, for the first time, the Canadian courts really recognize that Indigenous people face not just historic discrimination, but continued discrimination in the justice system. And as well, that the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in Canadian prisons, because the situation in Canada and Australia is virtually the same, because British settler colonialism is virtually the same. Um, the overrepresentation of Indigenous people was a crisis in the Canadian criminal justice system. So the court said the crisis wasn't that Indigenous people commit crime, the crisis was the response of the system was to incarcerate Indigenous people way beyond uh, their representation in the population. And the court said that in order to address this, judges needed to have two sets of information. They needed to know something about the circumstances of the individual, what brought them before the court, both the individual and systemic issues, and also they needed to know what sentencing options might exist. So as you can imagine, this decision was really uh, an incredible decision. We were very excited by it. We publicized news of the decision far and wide, and we waited uh, for the world to change, and, uh, and it didn't. Um, the criminal justice system is incredibly 
enamored with itself and change is very difficult to accomplish. And so um, after a year and a bit of waiting for things to happen uh, and with the help of some very um, far thinking judges in Toronto, uh, which, who opened uh, the first indigenous court, specific court in uh, Canada, well after uh, the Koori courts in Australia, we opened the first Gladue court and Aboriginal Legal Services, we started doing Gladue reports. We just thought people need this information, we're going to provide it um, because no one else is doing it. And so we just started doing it. We started doing it with one uh, staff person and we thought, well, if it works, um, we will find funding. It will be um, adopted more widely. And that is in fact, exactly what's happened. Um, we have now moved from um, 20 years ago uh, when the first Gladue court opened and we started writing our first Gladue reports. 20 years later, we now have 14 Gladue writers in uh, throughout uh, the southern and near north portions of Ontario. We have 14 Gladue writers. We have 14 Gladue caseworkers. They're working in 11 different locations. There are other uh, organi Indigenous organizations doing these reports in Ontario, and Lynn will speak about the situation in, in Quebec. Um, but every day, every day in Ontario, an Indigenous person is sentenced, and the judge who is sentencing that person has the advantage of a GLADU report or a GLADU letter that Aboriginal Legal Services has provided. And, and that's a significant that's a significant advance. And I will say that, that these reports make a difference in many different ways. Uh, as Narita pointed out and, you know, the, the, and Larissa, the lived experiences of indigenous people are so far from the lived experiences of most people in the criminal justice system that they are as if people were on other planets. And one of the things that Gladu reports do is they speak to those lived experiences, not just the individual experiences, but also the systemic factors that brought individuals before the court. And so that information that's contained in those reports regarding an individual offender, that inf that's information that judges have that they can take with them and do take with them um, when they go to other cases. So there is a multiplying effect of this. And again, as I mentioned at the outset, these reports are also really helpful for the individual themselves. They are not deficit-based reports. We are not simply made up of our deficits. We all have gifts. We all have abilities. It's important that those be stressed in these reports. But for many of our clients, they learn about what's happened to them, how they ended up where they were. Family members tell us things in the reports that they maybe wish they had told their their, their, their children and their grandchildren, but they didn't. And so these reports are very much transformative and uh, they, they make a real difference. And that's why we have, that's why Gluten reports have been adopted widely, not across the country, but in many parts of the country. Um, I'm very pleased that I've been able to uh, help in a, any small way with the development of the initiative in Australia. I wish you the best on this and I will continue to be involved in this project as much as I can. Um, thank you, miigwech. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, we of course are also grateful uh, at VALS for, for your ongoing support and, and for coming along to, to speak to us today about the Canadian experience. Um, I think it's really inspirational to hear that these reports have been transformative. Um, it's definitely set, set the benchmark for us here in Victoria and Australia more broadly. Um, and I think, you know, that the message that keeps coming through from everyone um, on the panel is that we're, we're trying to move away from just looking at deficits and taking that deficit approach. And I think that's a really important aspect um, and just wanted to reiterate that um, again as we, we move forward. Um, and now we come to our last speaker, Lynn. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. I also want to, to acknowledge the fact that Lynn very generously assisted us with, with training um, our staff, the, the report writers and, and the caseworker for the project. Uh, we're truly grateful for that. And um, I'll pass over to you now. 
Thanks so much. Um, I, I'd like to, for you guys to know and acknowledge that I am right now on the Mohawk territory, on Mohawk traditional land. And um, I want to give my thanks to them, Nye Um I'm happy to be here. I feel so far away from you guys. I was in Australia until December, I'm back home now in this cold weather, but here we go. Um, Gladue reports uh, in Quebec. So I'm going to really talk about Quebec, and, and I have to be quite honest. We were inspired by uh, by Jonathan's work and and Aboriginal Legal Services in Toronto, and by uh, BC uh, Vancouver, as well. Uh, we only started. We're late starter. We weren't the last one, but yet we started late. We started in uh, 2012. Um, doing glad you reports a little bit before um, a very important decision, the IP decision. Um, and so I'm going to talk a bit about more about uh, what these reports are, um, because they do differ, they're, they're different than, than other reports, such as a pre-sentence report. Um, so um, what I find very specific about these reports first, to have, you know, have seen both, is that these reports, they're, uh, I mean, I'm just first going to explain how what they look like but uh, when you read one of those reports they're they're in there is it's a storytelling it's the story of someone uh, uh, it's it's the story of that person's past but it's also the story of the of the generation prior to this person and and as Jonathan said sometimes they learn about that so um, we have uh, it's chronological it's descriptive it's narrative it's in the language that that they they recognize themselves because it's their language. It's not like we don't make it all like with very long professional words. Uh, so we keep it uh, as as if they were telling the story. Of course, it's not a verb verbatim, but it's still uh, really uh, as much as possible their words. Um, and it's a collection of recollection, in fact, and memories. Of, of the person itself, the accused in the case, but also of uh, family members, parents, uh, spouse, uh, siblings, friends, people that this person, you know, uh, the people that are in the close circle uh, of, of the person who we do the report for. Some people will argue that these reports uh, have similar content than a pre-sentence report. There are things that are similar in these reports, of course, uh, they're brought differently, though. Uh, I find that they more they have more details around it, and, and and I think the reason is really because the way we gather that information, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, later. Uh, but there is information that you don't find. I don't. We don't find in our pre-sentence report anyway here in in Quebec. Um, the history of racism and discrimination, personal, historical, and systemic. Uh, normally, we don't find that in pre-sentence reports. So we have that. Uh, their connection to the culture and to their elders and to their community, the strengths and skills. And as Jonathan said, uh, we, when we look at the past of the individual, yes, there's difficult moment, but they're the good moments, they're the good memories and whatever they can build on as well. The network of support. And, and one important thing is the introspection, the part where they are after revisiting their past and after having, you know, learned from even a past they didn't even know about from the parents and so on. But after that, they're more uh, capable of identifying what they want, need, willing to do. And, and that becomes a part where, in fact, it's their introspection and reflection about their own life. And what do they want for the future? And, and this work, this part there will become, in fact, um, eventually the recommendation. So as a writer, we don't tell them this is what you need to do and, and so on. But they start making this connection of, of why they're here today, why they're in that system. And then from then, from them identifying their needs, then we connect them and guide them to resources and help and people if they haven't already identified that uh, themselves. So that's a very, very particular uh, part. Um, so at the end of this report, of course, so we do have alternatives to detention. What could be, what else than jail would be, you know, would be suitable and would be, would address the underlying cause. Cause this, this whole thing is really about also recognizing that in, in a lot of the cases that we deal with it's not a criminal matter really sometimes it's there's so much social 
issues and problems and and um and there's wellness issues and and we try to um kind of direct someone towards something that will be alternatives that will also prevent them to coming back into that system so things that are meaningful for them realistic doable and then we become very creative in in finding alternatives to uh, detention so this report the big difference as well with pre-sentence report is it does not analyze does not assess uh, no interpret interpretation, no side taking by the writer. Uh, it does not measure the risk. In fact, we have this, this perspective and belief that um, the risk will be greater if the underlying causes are not addressed. So we're working at finding ways with the person and with the, the, the circle, uh, the support circle that, that participated in the interview to address uh, find means to address these issues, and then we feel that the risk then is reduced. Um, the the process uh, that we use, like, and I think it makes a big difference. And uh, we try to first the writers. We we try to have writers that are from the community as much as possible. And if they're not from the communities or that nation that that the the person is from then it is somebody that has an extensive knowledge, but also is recognized by, by these communities. So um, the people will, that do the, the Gladue report, we try to use like uh, humanistic interviews. We try to create safe space, uh, a safe environment. We use tools that are culturally appropriate. And so that will vary from one area to the other. We use tools that are non-intrusive that really brings the person uh, to do storytelling. So we're not asking a bunch of questions. We're not interrogating. We're really, uh, we use this genogram to start knowing the person. And I always tell people when we do reports, I said, I'm here to get to know you because I'm going to be writing about you. So we don't, we're not their voice, but we're in fact the person that will write so their story can be heard. Um, I find that it's a process that does empower people uh, because we give them, um, we're flexible in the structure that we're using in the process that we're using. So we're, uh, they're the one that are gonna be, we're gonna guide, they're gonna be directing. They wanna go and talk about something more than something else. They're not ready for that. We respect the pace. So it's a bit different in the approach than, you know, um, that what I've seen in pre-sentence report because I sat in, in pre-sentence report interview to kind of compare. Um, I find that also one reason that we get so much information is because we don't represent authority. We're from the communities where we're, you know, Aboriginal uh, um, organization. Uh, they know we're there. Not, we're not going to be judging. We're there to help. We're not there to take sides, but we still, you know, I wouldn't do that if I didn't want to help, of course. Uh, so that does make things um, much easier. Um, it's a process, and I'm going to quote one of my co-worker, uh, she's Inuk, and she's from, her name is Phoebe Atagutaluk, and she says it's a process where the person goes many steps back to move a few steps forward, and she says, you have to know where you're coming from to clearly know where you're going or where you should be going, and so she says that, and she does explain that, and it does make a, a lot of sense, so, and as uh, Jonathan was saying earlier, from that, like how many people have learned about elements from their past or, or the past of their parents that they did not know? How many reconnections did I see in families or understanding of why? Uh, you know, I, I hear often no wonder why. And uh, so, so those are um, things that uh, happen in the process as well. Um, it is, to me, also a good way to educate the system, the, the, the court in general. And we do try to educate and bring that difference between uh, why we have, sometimes we do have re, um, pre-sentence report and then we have a gladue report for the same case. And there's a lot of difference in those two reports and sometimes we have to explain why. So we've had the court uh, understand what we do, how we do it. So easily uh, to do a gladue report it's a, it's a process that can require maybe four to six or even more meetings with the the accused himself and then the family and so on so it's not something that's done in two hours and so on 
uh, then we do have like, you know, like we, we space the, um, the interview. So the person can also have that reflection because it's a process where they're, I find they're kind of uh, growing as well in, during the process and, and realizing things. Um, so to me, it's in fact a report that allows the reader to know more about the accused. But instead of having a report that is summarized and comes to conclusion, it is the reader uh, who comes up to the like to read the whole story. So it's much more longer than the pre-sentence report. And, and some people have criticized that it's too long. I have my 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 input on this one, but and and then the writer can better understand what the person has gone through. Um, the strengths in the network, uh, and then the, uh, the reader will make his own conclusion. And a, a judge is better ability to, I think, uh, to see, uh, to make a decision and, and see if whatever plan is uh, an alternative to detention that is proposed and, and suggested in this is suitable under the circumstances and reasonable in this case, and will be helping not only the accused, but helping as well the community in which he will be going back in the future. Um, so I don't know, I didn't check time. So I have no idea how I did in time and I still have two things, but uh, Andrea, uh, I don't know where I'm at. So, well, I wanna thank you. And, and I did work with you guys and um, I will continue. I will be back in Australia. So um, this collaboration is definitely not over. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, I think you did pretty all right for time. I wasn't um, keeping track too closely because I was listening to you, to be entirely honest. Um, but yeah, I think uh, and something you've mentioned today and that you also mentioned in the training that I was lucky enough to attend, um, this idea about the, the person who, um, for whom the, the report is being written, um, that the actual process itself is an opportunity for, for introspection for reflection on their life and, and what they want for the future. Um, I think that's a very powerful part of the process as well. Um, and also, um, I think a really important point is the fact that writing these reports takes quite a long time. Um, and, and that's one of the strengths of the reports as well, um, that it gives people the opportunity to sit with with the person who's before the court, um, with their family, with the community members, and it's not a rush process. And I think that um, that brings a lot of value to the information that's provided to the court um, who makes that important sentencing decision about whether someone's going to prison and if so, for how long. Um, as you can see, all of our, our speakers are uh, visible now. Um, I can see uh, there was some time allocated for questions. I can see particularly Thalia has been very active um, in, in answering the questions. So a lot of those questions have been answered um, already, but I think um, I also perhaps it might be a good opportunity just, just to give the, the panelists a chance to talk to something that might have been raised by another panelist or um, one of the questions that you would particularly like to, to focus on. So I might, might give you that opportunity before I perhaps select one question to focus on in, in our final moments. So I did see a question about uh, judicial education and um, bringing judges on side. Um, let me say that, uh, and I've, I'm fortunate, I, I, I have been able to travel the country uh, both countries actually, um, yours and mine, doing judicial education. Um, but I think what really makes a difference is when people can see Gladue reports. Um, because as, as Lynn pointed out, one of the difficulties with pre-sentence reports is they are so deficit-based, they are so risk-based. So when I go to a jurisdiction, a province uh, like Saskatchewan in Canada where they don't have Gladue reports, judges, don't really understand how things can be done differently because they feel they don't have any different tools. And this is, I think, what Gladue reports offer is they offer the judge both an understanding of the individual. So that person becomes a person. As Lynn said, you know, they're quoted. Uh, I don't know in Australia, but in Canada, you can go through the entire criminal justice system as an accused person and never say a word. 
you know, your lawyer will plead you guilty, your lawyer will accept the facts, you just sit there mute. And often lawyers discourage people from speaking. And so the Gladue report first, these individuals speak. So judges feel, oh, I, I know something about this person. But also when you know something about the person and then also as Lynn pointed out importantly, when you know what op options are out there, you can start to do things differently. But legislation that says you need to do things differently but doesn't actually create the environment where anything is done differently, when there is anything different offered, that will likely fail. And so what is so for me significant about the Gladue Report initiative is that it starts to change the process. And by doing that, it makes what is abstract, how do I do this thing as a judge, it makes it real because people have real tools to do those things. What Jonathan says is true, but in Victoria, we have been able to build on our experience of working very closely with the Aboriginal community through the Aboriginal Justice Agreement and also through the um, contribution, the very significant contribution that we have with the participation of elders and respected persons but also in the Koori Court, voice is emphasised and we do give a voice to the accused participant uh, in every conversation that's held. The exciting piece of the puzzle, as far as I'm concerned, is that this project has the potential to roll out the advantages and the significant benefits of the Koori Court to a broader community of um, judicial officers and it will enable them to do their job better for the future, not just for Aboriginal participants, but for any person who is a member of a minority group in the community. It'll give them a much better perspective and understanding. And that two-way learning is what is really the very exciting thing about this project. Thank you, Judge Lawson and Jonathan. Um, I think, Lynn, did you have something that you would like to add to that? Yeah, but I don't remember what it is. <laughs> at... <laughs> uh, but just just maybe a little thing is um, about the voice. You know, I when I read one of the things that I find and I just did it last week and there was a glad report today and, and uh, heard in court. Um, of a young woman, but uh, when I was talking with the, the, the family, it also, every time, like I had this father who just talked about everything and she learned so much from him, from, from, from her own report, but um, he was devoted, like he was preparing, she was detained. And, and so they had prepared her house uh, because she was, we were hoping, everybody was hoping she was come back, coming back and so on. And, and then I, I, I said to him, would you like to talk at sentencing, would you like to talk? I mean, he was talking so much to me for the report. And I said, because you can address the court and talk uh, for your daughter on sentence. And I find that that happens a lot because we open that door that they can be heard, the relatives, not only the person, but the relatives and stuff. And and I invite them, I ask them all, all the time, if you if you want to, you know, I may, I, we can, uh, I'll write it in the report that the person would like to be heard and they do. So it adds to that court is also seeing the report, but connecting with uh, members of that community, elders, uh, sometimes it's elders, sometimes it's relatives. So it just makes, it just connects all these people and it just humanizes it even more than if we didn't do it, yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Thalia or Narita or Larissa, was there something you would like to, to add in the last few minutes as well. I want to give everyone an opportunity to well, for final comments if you would like. Um, I, ju I just want to say, um, it, following on from Lynn and Jonathan's contributions, um, just how important it is to emphasize the process of preparing the reports. Of course, um, you know, they have a role in, in sentencing, but what we really want to do is strengthen and empower the person through their capacity to um, tell their story on their terms um, and then not just to hear that story but to provide the wraparound support that they need to um, you know continue or change their journey um, in the ways that are meaningful 
to them. So for us, sentencing isn't the end point. It's about putting them in a place in their lives um, that they can move forward um, in a way that, you know, gives them some hope rather than puts all the power just with the courts. Thank you, Thalia. Um, Larissa or Narita, would you like to add anything? Oh, only just to underline, I think, a point that's been made through what people have said, but I think is really critical in terms of understanding how we make positive reforms. And I think this is a really good example where we've seen the judiciary working with the profession, particularly our community controlled organisation and academia and being able to do a really great exchange with other jurisdictions about what's working and what's not. And um, I just think it's a really good example of how particularly you need that relationship between the judiciary and the system with the community to get those positive results. Thank you, Larissa. Um, and yes, I think this, this project is very much set up to succeed with, with the support we have from, from um, academics and, and from the bench as well. Um, Narita, last but not least, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I just want to thank um, all of the panellists for their time um, and expertise and willingness to openly share um, with everybody um, that has um, joined our webinar and all of those who will um, join it uh, via um, its recorded session when that's uploaded on our website. I know this is an important conversation for many to listen to and it is a first step um, I think in changing the justice system in Victoria um, to work like Judge Lawson said not just for Aboriginal communities but um, for many of our refugee and migrant communities and people of colour who um, have many of the same um, confronting experiences with the justice system that we do. Thank you, Narita. Um, I guess Narita said it already, but just want to um, wrap up by again saying thank you for um, all of the panellists who participated today. I've learned so much. Um, I'm sure everyone else has as well. Um, I'm very excited for this project going forward and, and for the, you know, across Victoria um, and in other, you know, countries as well in Canada, everyone working together. Um, to, to achieve better outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, as Narita said, um, there'll be a recording available for this. Um, we'll share that in the next couple of days. Um, you can find more information on our website. If you have any questions um, that we didn't get to today or that you didn't get a chance to, to ask, please feel free to email me. Um, this is a pilot project. It's an ongoing conversation and, and I think that yeah, we very much welcome everyone to partake in that conversation and, and to discuss this further with us. Um, all right. Well, I think that's, that's it for us for this morning. Um, thank you once again to everyone who was on the panel and also for everyone who attended today. Bye, everyone. Thank you.